Welcome everyone. Once again, thank you for joining in. I am Simran Gulati, Campus Director and a Millennium Fellow at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And I'll be the moderator for today's global webinar. So today we're going to learn about the importance of philanthropy in our society. We have a very special guest among us, Pia Infante. We will be learning today from her journey and experience the way to build a more trusting relationship with the organizations we interact on a daily basis. After our guest speakers sharing, we will have an open Q&A session for all the fellows where you can ask questions to our guest speaker. So I would like to start with by introducing Pia. So she is born in Philippines, raised in California. Pia is the oldest daughter in an immigrant family. She strongly believes that all of us have the collective imagination and the power to redesign philanthropy to send to the people we serve. We serve. Pia brings her jobs as a former high school teacher, organizational development consultant, and a nonprofit manager to her work. She is nationally recognized advocate for trust-based philanthropy and radically embodied leadership. She chairs the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project Steering Committee and serves on the Board of Media Justice Organization. Pia is also a visiting faculty at the University of Vermont Rubenstein School of Environment and speaks teaches in many, city, in many settings. She holds an MA in Education for the School of Social Research and BA in Rhetoric from the University of California at Berkeley. She is a proud longtime resident of Oakland. Pia, we are really grateful to have you among us today, and we hope to learn as much as we can from you. So, um, would you like to share a few words with us? Yes. Hello. 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 Hi. Wow. Um, first of all, it's just beautiful to see your faces and see. Um, you showing up with all this light from so many, so many continents and so many places. So it's very um, soothing to my heart, if that makes sense. It's a very intense time, especially, well, all over the world, but as you know, in the United States, it's, um, we have these multiple pandemics and systems failures that are all uh, trend, all unfolding simultaneously. So there's something about being in community globally that already I feel better about the world and the future. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Sam, for inviting me. Thank you, Noha, for organizing me. Thank you, Simran, for introducing me. Um, I feel I have as much to learn from you as uh, I may have to share. Um, another couple of thoughts about me in terms of introduction is that I never planned on working in philanthropy. I had planned on being a high school teacher and maybe a high school administrator for my entire career. And what happened was after two years of teaching high school in the Bronx, New York, I was burnt out and exhausted by the system's failure that is the public school system in the United States. So I had to take a step back and ask myself, you know, how did I want to serve and make a contribution? So I currently am heading up a philanthropy that is spending out our endowment, which I'll speak to in a little bit. I think it's important right now to talk about not sitting on our resources, whether they are monetary resources, whether, you know, however they are, not, not sitting on them, not hoarding them, but freely sharing them in a way that also gives us joy and delight. So I experience a lot of joy and delight in my work, which is, you know, if you work in philanthropy, that's not really how it's set up culturally for a, a queer woman, um, an immigrant in this country, so we can we can get into that if we want to. The other thing I will say about myself is that I have a toddler. She is almost two years old, and um, she has stunningly transformed my world. 
And I don't know if any of you are parents, you know, wave at me if you are. Um, but being a parent during the time of COVID and potentially disintegration of um, actual democracy is its own level of stress. Uh, and, but she also brings me a lot of um, learning. She, she's my teacher and, and you all are teachers as well. So I wish that I had half an hour to hear your stories. Um, I'm not sure what else to say by way of introduction. So maybe I'll just let Simran, maybe you can just ask me some questions that you think might be useful for me to address here. But mostly just thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for leading in your context. Thank you for being present and here. Thank you for listening so much. Um, I always feel a little awkward doing so much talking, but that is what I was invited to do. So um, Simran, maybe I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. So yeah, I have a few questions for you. So beginning with, uh, I want to ask you that building a trust between people requires a lot of time and hard work. So how do we take that to an organizational level? And what does it take for an organization to build a trust based culture both internally and externally with its stakeholders or potential funders? That's a wonderful question. Thank you. I think there's no way to build trust in any context with ourselves um, be known in terms of what, what our purpose is. So I'll share with you my purpose as a leader is to, I think I have an actual mantra for this. I was in a fellowship much like this one and I came up with a mantra that goes like this. Um, I am divine power taking courageous action for all of us. Meaning I think that my life purpose is to be as courageous as possible while also being vulnerable, being known, um, sharing my questions as well as my answers. And Honestly, one of my big questions right now, given the fierce urgency of our times, whether we're talking about climate chaos, economies, um, societies, and what it means to be, you know, a society that takes care of its people. I ask myself often, what is the best use of me that doesn't use me up? You know, I don't know if any of you have been experiencing a sense of overwhelm, of, you know, the, the pace, the, the urgency makes us almost run faster when perhaps what we need to do is take a, a step back and look at, you know, where we're going, you know, where we're going and how, how are we getting there? So I guess my first response to the notion of how to build trust is what I'm trying to do with you which is just to, to allow myself to be known and to be transparent about my motives, right? And when you are talking about institutional philanthropy, and I'll just say a couple words about institutional philanthropy in the United States. It is a sector that is sometimes very impervious to sharing power. <laughs> Um, what happens when uh, an individual, let's just say like Jeff Bezos, you know, what happens when an individual in this society or maybe globally accrues a lot of money and the way they do it is often um, extractive. It often relies on profit margins that are very narrow, not treating workers and humans particularly well, not providing maternity leave, not providing sick pay. You know, when that kind of wealth is accrued by an individual, something strange happens in which all of a sudden society attributes um, expertise and um, power and decision making to wealthy individuals, which I think technically is not particularly of sound judgment. <laughs> You know, just, just because somebody got rich or wealthy doesn't mean that they are capable of leading 
society. And we can see all over the world that this is the case, right? And a very exaggerated case here in the United States. So I think with philanthropy, we have to understand that its origins are in building wealth that is often on the backs of the poor and the working and the middle class. And then um, what then is our responsibility? I think your question that, that's the title of this session is what is the role of philanthropy? And for me, the role of philanthropy is to transmute and transform the very, the very structures and systems that, that allow it to be. Meaning, just in the United States example, if you look at the past multiple centuries, the wealth that has been built here was built from um, genocide and slavery. So without accounting for genocide and slavery as the way that the wealth, and not just the wealth, the democracy in this country was built. So without accounting for that, there can be no trust between an institution of philanthropy and say a nonprofit um, or an NGO, right? So first that must be acknowledged that the power that exists has nothing to do with the individual worthiness of any of the representatives of the actual organizations. I am in no way smarter or better or more expert than you, you know? just because you work at an NGO and I work at a philanthropy. So the first thing that I think it's required to build trust institutionally is to acknowledge that and to, um, what is the word? To proactively work against the culture and the bias and the, the, the white supremacist hegemony that is baked into the actual structure and system. So, um, I'll check the chat box in case there's questions here, but, but I really want to emphasize that institutional philanthropy has a long way to go to acknowledge that what we really should be doing is reparations. You know, that's what we should really be doing in order to address the racial inequalities, the economic inequalities, and the literal difference between worlds of say somebody who lives in East Oakland right, and somebody like Jeff Bezos, we have to actually address um, the, the, the conflict, the violence, and the, the tension in the creation of these structures. And even so, I still work at a foundation, right, I haven't walked away from philanthropy simply because it was built in this way, because I'm not trying to walk away from our society. And what I think philanthropy's role in the world right now is, is to um, help build the power of the most vulnerable to be able to reimagine the societies and systems um, in which we live. That is the role of philanthropy. I think it is quite terrifying that the United States is relying on philanthropy to ensure a fair election. That's terrifying and that should not be the case. Every country, every society should be able to listen to the will of the majority of the people and follow it. But as you can see from the news and Twitter, this country um, is not doing that. <laughs> so I think that it is a little bit terrifying that philanthropy's role, at least in the United States right now, seems to be ensuring that we have some level of fair elections and that we address voter suppression. Um, I don't think philanthropy should be the guardrails for democracy. I really don't. I think that, I think that, that the institutions that represent our public service and public good should be providing that to the majority of its people. Meaning there should be no homelessness, there should be no hunger, there should be no one who, who is undereducated, who doesn't um, go all the way to graduate school if they want to. And, that, and there should be no one on this planet that doesn't have full and adequate healthcare, right? So the fact that philanthropies all over the world and many of them based in the United States are, have their missions and strategies to try to provide those things speaks to a much bigger problem that I believe that you all um, and we're looking to you, <laughs> Millennium Fellows, I believe that you all are working towards, right? Which is how do we make a global society economically, ecologically, 
um, educationally and public health wise work for everyone, literally everyone in every caste system, everyone at the bottom of these caste systems should be fully resourced. Why? Because it actually is more effective for economies. It is actually more effective for societies. It actually means that um, we can all flourish. And you know what? The Jeff Bezos and the very, very wealthy of the world, they still get to be wealthy. You know, in this scenario, this is not a chop off the heads of the wealthy um, for the proletariat. There are visions, I think, that include everyone from the very wealthiest to the very least wealthy in terms of finances. So I know I'm giving you a very long answer, but I think that all of these things have to be acknowledged in institutional relationships and they have to be proactively um, provided for. For instance, uh, my organization is spending out all of our money and within about two years, within about two years, I will be unemployed. So I may be looking to you to hire me. Um, and we are, the way that we make our grants is we, we don't have a competitive grant making process. We proactively uh, uh, support and approach those who uh, we think are the least funded by traditional philanthropy. That means of course, women um, and leaders of color, which receive less than 5% of US philanthropic dollars go to literally women and uh, uh, people of color led organizations in this country. And then we, uh, you know, our particular philanthropy is interested in um, a strong civil society, civic society, human rights, and journalism in particular. So those are the things that we have decided to address, um, you know, in collaboration with our NGO and nonprofit partners. And I will say the other thing that builds trust is we listen to our partners. And that sounds very simple but we actually listen, ask for feedback, and then we take their feedback. Meaning we reorganized our entire mission and strategy um, in order to, to meet the requests of our NGO partners who said, when we told them that we were spending out, they said, it's very sad that you will be going away, but we would like you to go and convince the rest of the sector, the rest of philanthropy, to operate in this trust-based way, which means we give multi-year unrestricted support at the very minimum three years for those in our multi-year cohort. And um, we, we provide support beyond the check when asked. We, um, you know, I don't know if Sam ever got to one, but we, we would host these retreats where the purpose of the retreat was to help our leaders restore and, re and, and rest. So we had a leader a movement leader from the United States come to one of our retreats and she slept for 50% of the time because she had three young kids and she was leading a national organization for labor. And we thought that was a win, it was an absolute win that she rested. I think right now rest is a win just as much as purpose and just as much as work. So I hope that you are also investing in rest for yourself because we need you. Um, that is my very, very long-winded answer to your very good question, Simran. So I'm happy to take more from you or anybody else. Thank you so much for sharing. It was quite an insight, insightful answer. So following up, I have one more question. Um, so how did you get into philanthropy and uh, how can young leaders can get started into the work of philanthropy? Great question. I mean, like most of the career turns in my life, it was quite accidental or maybe it was destiny, who knows? But I, like I said, I started out as a high school teacher and I, from there, I, from, from teaching in, in the New York City public uh, high school system, public school system, I became very interested in questions of systems change because the system, the educational system in most of the urban areas in the United States is almost designed to keep people out of higher education. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not designed to, to nurture critical thinking or build a sense of self-worth or validate the lived experiences of those people. So I'll just tell you a story from high school teaching. 
I had a student who's, who I still am in touch with through social media. Her name is Ruby. Um, and she never came to class, but I thought she was one of the most brilliant students I had ever met. And she never came to class. So I, being a very young student teacher, thought, I'm just not interesting enough. My lesson plans are not interesting. I have to get more interesting. So I put all this time and energy into trying to design lesson plans that I thought would interest her. And she still didn't come to class. <laughs> Every once in a while, she would submit an essay that was just brilliant. And so finally, I started asking around, what's up with Ruby, everyone? Like, why, why does she, does she not like school? What's going on? I came to find out that her mother worked three jobs um, and she was a single mother. And Ruby had four siblings um, from the ages of maybe four, four years old to 12 years old. And she was 16. And she spent most of the day taking care of them, getting them to school, making sure they were eating. So it was my first lesson in learning that you can't help someone that you don't know. <laughs> you, can't, you can't help someone for whom you demonstrate no curiosity about their, their experience, their life, their context. So from there, I realized, okay, I just need to find out from Ruby what could be helpful to Ruby. So I worked with her to find some childcare for her youngest sibling so that she could get to school earlier. Um, so, and, and, you know, did some other things in the sort of family support realm. And then she started being able to come to class. And sh long story short, she, um, she applied to, uh, to community college in New York City and is now herself a teacher. Um, but, but what I will say about that is it, it was a turning point in my career around systems because I felt like the system that was trying to educate Ruby was actually doing her more harm. If I was a different kind of teacher, I might have been writing her up for her absences. I might have been, you know, labeling her as disruptive. I might have been tracking her to not go to college, right? Um, I might have been lowering my expectations of her capacity and her potential. And, and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to drink the Kool-Aid and do that. So I got very interested in systems change and I started studying systems and culture change work with um, people who, you know, are organizational development and systems change um, learners and experts. And basically I gave myself my own graduate program. I mean, I got a degree in executive coaching as well. And um, in addition to the master's I got in education, but I just apprenticed with some very, very effective, brilliant um, heart-led um, organizational systems and psychologists uh, type practitioners. So from there, I actually started my own business. I was probably younger than some of you um, and older than some of you, but I was um, maybe in my mid-20s, mid to late 20s, I started an organizational consulting business that specialized in leadership transitions, um, you know, changing systems around culture and infrastructure in order to more fully demonstrate its values for equity. And I ran that business for a while. And I remember my first clients, I would walk into the room and they would think I was the assistant for the consultant that had been hired. And they would ask for things like coffee or notebooks, you know, and as a joke, I would go get coffee and notebooks. And then I would, you know, stand up at the front of the room and start the meeting. But you know, just to say that we have wisdom and something to offer at every age if we do it in a way that is in a trust-based way. Um, anyways, from there, I started my own business. Then I worked for a nonprofit leadership development group called Rockwood Leadership Institute. And then I was recruited into this role as a funder. Um, so that is how I ended up here. I do see a question, so I want to address it from Ganesh. Often philanthropy is seen as a way to evade tax evasion. Yes, I agree. Um, glaring disparity. How do you reconcile the need for greater taxation and addressing those inequalities? Um, Ganesh, I think that you work at all, at all points here. So I also work with um, wealthy folks. For instance, um, there's a group I think called Responsible Millionaires that is working on policy change in the United States to increase taxation of donor advised funds and um, endowments. 
So I think that we have to not assume that philanthropy itself, just the grant making end, can solve the problems that are inherent. So I think two things, we work on taxation and better taxation, um, more, much more assertive taxation for um, the uber wealthy, the wealthy, and um, we don't allow the wealthy to, to use um, the, the kind of construct of a foundation or a donor advised funds to basically hide money. Um, because I often joke around philanthropy is not the Cayman Islands. We should not be a place where the wealthy, well, the wealthy people just sort of uh, leave their money out of the public domain. I think the second way we look at that, Ganesh, is we not only look at the, the monies that are being given as grants, but we look at the investments. So what is a foundation doing with its investment portfolio? How, how and through whom and what is it empowering through our you know, the 90% of our dollars that are invested. And so our philanthropy has invested much more in community-based um, solutions than in traditional, the traditional market. So there are multiple ways to look at this question. And, but I think the power of your question is that philanthropy itself alone, without government, without taxation, without a very strong civil society does not solve for inequality because philanthropy was, re, was created from inequality. So it literally cannot solve it. So if you only try to solve inequality from the standpoint of a foundation, I think that's a recipe for not winning. <laughs> so, you know, j just, like, just like our political system, there's, you know, there are many ways that people are trying to strengthen democracy in the United States. So there's the grassroots organizing and the long-term voter base building. There's power building in lots of communities. Um, there's trying to change, trying to make sure that, um, that, that the districts don't get redistricted so that the poor and the middle class and the working class have less representation in government, whether it's local, state, or, or, or national. So your, your answer, your question brings about, for me, the, the, the idea that it's all multiplicities, just like all of you are working in so many different ways and maybe approaching the same problems with different lenses, different strategies, and different possible solutions. I think that's the best way to go about it, because the, the truth is the complexity of our problems, the complexity of this multi-pandemic systems failure in many in many of, uh, of our countries, um, they, they do not have singular answers. So we have to be multiple and varied and complex, and we have to have a learning orientation um, to, in order to move, uh, move towards right, the, the, the global society that we would all like to live in. Did I answer your question, Simran? I, I tried. Um, I'm happy to was, take more. It was quite good. It was quite insightful. It was quite good. So I, I guess we have a lot of questions from the fellows. So taking yeah. up that, um, so taking up the first one, Madeline, um, can you please have you and you can share, you can first introduce yourself and ask your question. Mm -hmm. So over to you, Madeline. Hi. Um, so my question was, I was wondering how um, Ms. Pia picks her organizations that she wants to work with, especially when many, uh, such as organizations like Amazon, have a history of being exploitive, and how uh, she or like other people who work in philanthropy pick good or ethical organizations, or maybe this is something that's not considered. Madeline, that's a wonderful question. It is definitely considered. Um, so first of all, we would never fund Amazon because Amazon is a private business with um, immense and ridiculous amounts of uh, wealth. <laughs> so we fund 501c3s. We fund um, nonprofits, basically, that are set up as nonprofits that have social good, you know, kind of built into their DNA. To narrow that down even more, we fund nonprofits that are working to um, solve for issues of inequality in the in the realms of journalism, civic engagement and civil society and human rights. So already that narrows the field, right? And so your question is among those organizations with, you know, what we might call social justice missions, right? How do we 
discern who might be sort of ethical in that realm. First of all, I'll say there are not a lot of con artists in the NGO or nonprofit sector. Very few nonprofits I've ever met are people who are trying to just, you know, take your money and use it for something else. For instance, Sam is an incredible example of the kind of leader that is a nonprofit leader. Uh, and Sam, have you met Sam? I mean, he's not going to take your money and go on vacation. You know what I mean? So first of all, I think the sector is already pretty much weeds out the, the people who are just trying to embezzle <laughs> just because the work and the life of, of a nonprofit uh, is, is not, is not particularly easy. Um, it's not sort of a place where a lot of, um, yeah, unethical people operate. I think that the question, most, most people in the nonprofit sector are ethical. I think the question is, do we care about things like, um, you know, effectiveness and how people manage their teams or their finances? So, you know, we do our um, upfront work to find out how organizations are perceived uh, publicly using tax, tax records and other public information to find out, is this an organization in good standing, you know? And, you know, honestly, some of the organizations we fund are very small organizations. So, you know, if the organization's budget is under a million or under 500,000, sometimes it might have some financial problems. So again, when we're looking through the lens of um, equity and racial equity, we know that some nonprofits and some grassroots organizations are starting off um, already with the cards stacked against them. So we're not just looking for nonprofits who are sort of get an, an A plus in every, in every um, you know, realm, because when you look under the hood of an NGO, often there are some issues. Maybe there are some management issues. Maybe there are some fiscal issues. That doesn't scare us, you know. Um, what we always look for is collaborative, humble, thoughtful leaders who acknowledge that they don't know everything, but they're willing to listen and learn from the people that they're trying to help. Um, and they are collaborative by nature. So I think that philanthropy doesn't have a problem funding unethical people so much as it funds the charismatic leaders who, you know, maybe have articles written about them or they win a lot of awards. But, but I think that's great. But we're always looking for the, uh, the leaders that are underprofiled, the leaders that, you know, maybe they don't spend a lot of time trying to get awards and attention, but they spend most of their time in in partnership and collaboration with the constituents that they're trying to serve um, in the teams that they're trying to strengthen and build and, um, and delivering the programs. So I think it, what it means on our part, and just as you'll read, if you look at trust-based philanthropy is that we do the homework and we look for those kinds of organizations and leaders. So I don't worry so much that um, someone's gonna use the money wrong, you know, because I think that folks running organizations have a better sense of where the money should be directed. But I think it's more that we really seek to support the leaders who don't get um, the spotlight shown on them all the time. Okay, I see another question from Amber. Uh, Simran, should I let Amber ask the question out yeah, loud? Yeah, sure, yeah, sure go. Amber, you can ask a question now. Yes, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and speaking with us. Um, my name is Amber Ree Robinson, and I'm a Millennium Fellow at Florida International University in Miami, Florida. Um, so you briefly kind of spoke about your background. And so I wanted to know um, if you could speak about how you incorporate intersectionality into your work. As you know, you had discussed like um, racial equity and also like reparations and other things like that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, sending love to Florida. Um, so, you know, when I think of intersectionality, I think first of all about my identity. You know, I'm I'm on many things. I mean, I'm I'm from some groups that are quite underprivileged. You know, um, my parents came from very humble um, backgrounds and on farms and in the city in um, the Philippines. I am a woman of color in the United States. I am queer, and I'm married actually to a black woman. And so our family already has multiple sort of 
oppressions that could be um, that we could be targeted. But I also have privilege. So I have, you know, a master's degree. I um, I work in a, a very wealthy field, and I work for what used to be a very wealthy foundation, which you know we have less money now because we're giving it away. So first of all, when I think of intersectionality, I think that all my identities are present all the time, and I do not hide them for any reason. Some of them I can hide, and some of them I can't. Um, you know, I don't have to in meeting a fellowship like yours, I don't actually have to talk about um, being queer or um, being an immigrant if I didn't want to. But I think part of intersectionality is that we get to coexist in all of our identities and all of our roles, like being a mom simultaneously. The other thing I think, the other way intersectionality, the way I think about it is when we, when we read, um, when I came on as co-ED, we had, um, we completely changed the board composition. So our board used to be mainly, um, you know, boomer age white folks, all of whom I loved, but we've transitioned the board to all an almost entirely POC board that has two black women um, and everyone's under 50, which is pretty young for a foundation board in the United States. So we've a younger POC board. So I think that, and then they bring all these different fields and experiences and identities to that board. So I think that intersectionality works in the composition of your people. And then lastly, I think intersectionality works in the lens and the framing in which we look at our work. So when we're looking for partners, whether they be partners that we fund or partners that we just wanna do collaborative funding or work with, um, we are looking for the intersections of, particularly in the United States, the United States really um, elevates Ivy League degrees, for instance. So um, we also honor that, you know, a degree from a community college is like just as incredible. Like you can get, you can, uh, the, the quality of the, um, the work doesn't depend on the, you know, the stature or the wealth of an institution. Um, so, so I think intersectionality is um, everywhere. You know, I think it, it's, it's how we do our grant making. It's how we do our investing. It's how we're thinking about spending out. It's how we... Um, invite people to be on our board. It's how it's who we partner with in the trust based philanthropy project. Um, you know, I, you've already heard me talk about our grant making. So we don't grant make one identity or one issue area or one region. So in a sense, our grant making is already intersectional. Um, I hope that answers your question. It's a great question. I'd love to hear your answers to this question. <laughs> Thank you. I think it answered it uh, pretty well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Amber. Um, so next we have Leonora. So you can turn on the mic now and introduce yourself first and ask a question. Thank you. Hi. Um, yes. Uh, so um, I'm very inspired by you, Ms. Pia. Uh, thank you so much for answering my question. Um, I find that we have a bit of similarities with our story. I'm also Filipino and I also grew up abroad. I grew up in Qatar and I'm also the firstborn daughter of an immigrant family. So I'm very happy to have you with us today. Um, I wanted to ask for you in your opinion, what would be the best um, path or best step to encourage immigrant families to practice philanthropy? Because based from um, what I've seen and experienced as well growing up in a primary, primarily Filipino community abroad is that our immigrant communities are kind of not as engaged with philanthropy because they themselves are having a hard time settling into the countries that they migrated in. So I would very much appreciate your input on that. Thank you so much. Of course. Lenora? <laughs> <It's good. laughs> Filipinas <laughs> Uh, so Paris <laughs> okay, all right, from Paris, asking this beautiful question. So um, first I'll say, it's so wonderful to meet a sister. So um, all of you are my sisters and brothers, and so please stay in touch, or cousins, or whatever you want to be. Um, but I think that the truth is that the poorest families are often doing more philanthropy than the richest families. Like when there are when there is research about who you know giving broken down, it's often it's often immigrant and working families that are very very generous 
You know, you think about, I think about my parents and when they immigrated here, they opened their home for all the rest of our relatives to come live with us. I didn't always like this because I wanted my own room, but you know, I've shared my bed with aunties and cousins and grandmothers and mm. my Lola and I slept in the same bed for like three years. So I will say the generosity of immigrant families is already pretty well documented. And I don't know that we need to do more to engage them in, in this kind of philanthropy, as much as just um, actually just acknowledge that the generosity and the and what they give is a philanthropy, you know, just because they're not set up as a donor advised fund or a foundation or something like that doesn't mean that they're not practicing philanthropy, you know, when we um, give what little we have, while we're also struggling to get our feet on the ground the way my parents did. Um, that is a philanthropy that is in that's empowering and enabling, you know, others who are behind you to come through. And so I would just say, bless them, um, acknowledge them, and, and maybe name that that philanthropy is just as important as, you know, the gates, you know, because in essence, you know, when you have so little and you're sharing all of it, and then you have so much and you're only sharing a little bit of it, I mean, to me, the generosity of an immigrant family is, is often completely outpaces that of someone like Donald Trump. Um, so just tell them like, they're amazing. Give them an award, you know, throw them dinners, you know, get the moms like a spa or something. I would love a spa, I, you know. So, um, but thank you for that question. And it's so nice to meet you. I hope you're doing well and being safe. Thank you. Thank you, Lenora. Thank you, Pia. Um, so next we have a question from uh, Chloe. Um, can you uh, turn on the mic and ask uh, the question? Thank you. Hello. Hello, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story. It reminded me a lot how I was in high school. I didn't go to class a lot because I was helping my family. So I want to thank you for sharing that story. It was really inspiring. Um, currently, I'm a campus director at the University of Pittsburgh, and my question was, you said something about making sure an organization doesn't hold on to resources. I was wondering how you would do that while also being sustainable financially. Can I notice a lot of nonprofits um, fall apart because there's a lack of um, business knowledge and financial knowledge? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Chloe. It, um, I'm so glad that you said hi. And I'm so glad Ruby's story touched you. She's, she's amazing. She touches a lot of people. Um, beautiful question. Um, I think for NGOs and nonprofits, um, part, they're, they're sort of also set up to fail <laughs> because it's so difficult to get funding um, for operations. You know, a lot of NGOs get funding for the, the, the program work they're doing, like, you know, for you know, maybe for the fellowships that they host or the youth engagement that they do, but they don't get funding to keep their lights on, to, you know, pay for the Zoom subscription, to, you know, employ their staff. So I think that sometimes that's not just the individual problem of an NGO. I think it's a sector-wide problem. It's, it's a systems, we have to solve for it at a systems level. Um, I think one of the solutions to that is if foundations would give unrestricted general operating support more meaning that instead of giving a grant and saying, you have to spend this money on only this thing, just giving the grant and saying, spend it on anything you need to spend it on, put some of it away in reserve, you know, that would really help. So when we think about power, um, Chloe, I think about the fact that nonprofits aren't setting up the structures, you know, sector wide, it's often you know, like we talked about governmental, countywide or the philanthropic sector. So I think we need to move philanthropy to fund differently and that will solve for that problem at a systems level. I mean, and then I think that we need to provide leadership um, of nonprofits with a lot of support for how to, you know, how to manage budgets and resources and um, financial management. I mean, some of the problem is it's just hard to get funding. And so however good you are at Excel, if you're having a hard time getting someone to give you unrestricted support, that's not going to help. But sometimes I think that we just don't support our nonprofit leaders enough. Um, so we want you all to be very well supported in these leadership positions. And so I think it's also the role 
of philanthropy to make sure that we are giving dollars for you know leadership development like this and also the other very specific skills that come along with executive leadership. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Pia. Um, so we have one more question from Dennis. Um, Dennis, can you introduce yourself and ask the question? Uh, I'm, I'm Dennis um, from yes. University of Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, very, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for your talk. It was very insightful, especially when you talked about reparations. It's something I've always thought that should be more of a common sense issue. They should not be debated for so long. So uh, my question was uh, with regards to philanthropy, like how much does it actually work? Uh, there's a model, there's an economic model I saw a while back that, that's been pioneered in Brazil by, it's called Economy of Communion, by I think by a religious based organization. So what they usually do is instead of taking the top down approach that philanthropy usually takes in that charity is a bit centralized, uh, the Economy of Communion uh, seeks to engage the community members, the target communities as equal partners. So they look for ways in which each, each member of the community can contribute to making their society better instead of just coming, like, because uh, I think philanthropy like tends to like give them money. Okay, that's what I think. Yeah, like just like it's it's very centralized in terms of the, the help, yeah. It doesn't engage mm -hmm. the community as equal members of, of a partnership, yes. So yeah, I was thinking, uh, yeah, my question was like, which of the two models actually works and how much does philanthropy work? Yeah, Dennis, that's a very brilliant question. Uh, the short answer is philanthropy doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the United States, we can't really say that philanthropy has, has ended inequality. In fact, inequality is worse now than it was 100 years ago. So I think that there's a lot of ways that the kind of philanthropy that's practiced in the United States actually doesn't work that well. And so the model that you're describing, which I also throw out, it's a beautiful example. Uh, the, um, there's regenerative economy models, there's um, participatory grant making, there's other models that I think uh, work very wonderfully and they do exactly what you're talking about, which is they just resource the community itself to do its own um, problem solving or its own um, creating its own banks. You know, it, I know that there's a group called Thousand Currents that you um, may know of or may be interested in, but the way they do their philanthropy is very much what you've described. It's more that they collaborate with the um, members of the community and they ask them, you know, what do you need now? I think the way that we give our dollars at my foundation actually helps do that. It doesn't, it doesn't re completely restructure philanthropy the way you're describing, but I think there's a way of giving that actually then transfers the decision-making and the power of shaping the solutions to the members of the community. And so I think trust-based philanthropy is um, like, a, a, what is the word? If we want to go from here to there, trust-based philanthropy is like a stepping stone <laughs> uh, to go in that direction, you know, because the the direction you're talking about, which I think, and I'm happy to end on this point, is really about community-centered solutions, but giving them resources to come up with them on their own, not 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 just giving them grant dollars or consultants, but just the center of the solution is in the center of the community. So, at, and creating its own economies and creating its own um, governance structures. So I think in order to get there, Americans in particular have to practice giving up power, right? It's a, so we don't get to reparations, right? We don't get to reparations without the most wealthy practicing what it means to give up decision-making. So while we might get to reparations in this country, I wanna see us uh, reinstate the the voter um, equality act from you know what I mean so there's 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 steps that I think that we need to take in order to move in that direction um, but I hope that it's your generation <laughs> that really like accelerates us so that in when you're doing your talk you know to the millennium fellows in 10 or 20 years you're talking about how we made reparations happen you know how did we um, save our planet. 
How did we create economies that work for everyone? How did we make sure everyone had health care? Um, and part of that is looking at the structural inequality that we're all suffering under imperialism, capitalism, and colonialism. Like these are, like what's happening in our world right now are basically the, the children of um, imperialism, colonialism, and um, um, genocide in many ways. So in, in order to um, get to reparations, there needs to be both an acknowledgement of what really happened. So not this revisionist history that America is the home of the free and the land of the brave, right? Um, and then also we need tools and practices and like there, there needs to be an integration of, of, of giving up power as part of what Americans need to learn. And honestly, um, I hope that we learn it. <laughs> I, hope that, I hope that we do, because I think that some of the problems we experience globally around inequality really come from the terrible conflict of what it means to be a democracy with this kind of um, extractive capital system. So I think we're gonna end on this question, <laughs> which is just great. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I think all of us agree how like in-depth answers they were and so informative. So thank you so much, Pia, once again for the like for the sharing and like all the examples you brought in democratization, like bringing that in the philanthropy as well as how like the pandemic. So you talked about that as well. So I think it was quite a lovely session. Thank you so much for coming in and. So this is the or this is almost the end of our session. So do you want to have like some any closing remarks and what is the best way we fellows can connect with you? So do you want to share with us? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you. I mean, from the questions that I didn't get to answer, I apologize. And the questions I did get to answer, it's clear to me why you are the Millennium Fellows. Um, I feel that I feel better for my daughter, um, who I wish you could meet, but she is just not around right now. But um, I feel like she's she's also a little powerhouse, and and I hope that she'll learn from you um, as she gets bigger. I mean, one of the things that I think about a lot is um, I think engaging in creativity, um, generative discussion, like we've had here proactive solutions is, is so much better than the kind of dialogue that sometimes happens in the US media, which is very depressing. It's just sort of like people yelling at each other um, about ego, you know, and I, I, I saw very little ego. There's very little ego in this, in this fellowship that I've experienced. It seems like a lot of intelligence and curiosity and, and empathy and care for one another, you know? I wish I could have heard all of your stories, each of you. Um, and the one thing I've been saying everywhere is that, you know, follow the nap ministry, you know? I think the way that I was taught to work was to work myself into the ground, you know, until I couldn't walk. <laughs> I want you and, and, and those and, 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 and myself now to find a way to be purposeful, but also joyful and delighted and regenerative. Like we don't get to a regenerative new way of being in the world without practicing it ourselves individually in our families, on our teams, in our organizations. We need practice, we need practice because the old world will teach us basically how to work, all, work ourselves into the grave, you know? So the new world, in the new world, we teach ourselves how to um, enliven so that we're, um, we're dancing, we're singing, we're connecting, we're solving for problems, um, not just with the intellect, but with the heart and the gut, you know? So we need our hearts and we need our guts and our intuitions, our spiritual practices, our relationships. So, you know, I'll say that the thing that I feel like is a, the, the most treasured in my life are the relationships, are the people for whom trust me and I trust them. And the fact that I'm here talking to you has a lot to do with Sam, 
you know, that I that Sam and I know each other, we've trusted each other. Um, and if Sam asks, I say yes. And I'm pretty sure that if I ask, Sam says yes. So it's relationships are that are like gold. So whatever we do, do our best to sustain ourselves and our relationships. And hopefully we live into a new world together. Um, it's been quite an honor to be with you, Millennium Fellows. I'm very excited about who you are and where you're going. Um, you can keep in touch with me on um, Twitter at Pia Vision. You can email me, I, I sent my email in the box. I'm also on Instagram if you just wanna see pictures of the baby. Um, I think it's, uh, let me see if I know my Instagram handle, hold on. Sam, you know it, it's, uh, I'll find it and put it in the box. But I also just wanna thank um, Noha and Simran um, and the entire MCN for, for inviting me and for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pia. And thank you everyone for joining in today. It was a lovely evening, evening for me, yeah. <laughs> evening day for everyone. So I hope you had a wonderful session today. And, uh, and if we have a webinar on 31st of October. So hope to see you soon on the session. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pia, once again. Thank you, Simran. Take care. Thank you so much.